Amen. Morning, church. How we doing? If you have your Bibles, open them up to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, we'll go there in just a second. Uh, two quick things. If you were here last week, we talked about the Journeys of Paul trip uh, that's coming up in October. Uh, we're having a meeting after the third service about that. If you can't make it to the meeting, you need to fill out the Connect card and say, I'm interested. Put an email on there, put your name on there, and we'll contact you about that. Uh, we're going to be going to Greece and to all the different places in the Mediterranean where the Apostle Paul took the gospel. And part of the trip is on a boat going where Paul went in his boat travels. So if you're interested in that, sign up. And then second, uh, the thing I wanna encourage you with is if you are not uh, serving anywhere, if you're not involved in anything, uh, but you're interested in wanting to know how to disciple, how to help uh, teach and build disciples, we're looking for some help in our kiddos uh, area. So if you would like to be trained and equipped to help disciple young people, I'll just, I'll just be really honest with you. That was the very first place I ever served in ministry was teaching kids. And it was one of the best things I ever did. Um, in fact, if it wasn't um, for doing this, I would probably be, just be down there with them uh, because they listen better sometimes anyway. So... Um, they, they, they appreciate me more. Um, so anyway, if you're interested, uh, we want to encourage you. Uh, use a Connect card. Say, hey, I, I'd like to help. Uh, we, we could use that, okay? All right, let's stand together. Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 5 through 9 this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. So you've already heard it in some of the songs we've sung this morning. Talking about Jesus as king, Jesus is Lord, Christ is King. If I were to say this morning, Jesus is Lord, Christ is King, most everyone in this room would amen that without hesitation. In fact, I would argue that most people gathering in churches this morning all over the place would amen that statement. In fact, I would even go so far as to say this, that Even those who are not Christians and not believers, when they hear you say Jesus is Lord or Christ is King, won't get that upset about it. They'll just chalk it up as, yeah, they mean Jesus is Lord of their hearts. You know, Jesus is King of their soul. Jesus is King over his little people called the church. And they would let you carry on. In fact, it might be argued that some of those same churches with Christians that I said would affirm that and say amen to that are actually amening what the unbelievers are amening. That they would be amening Jesus is Lord and King of the heart, King of his church. But where people start to squirm is if I make a statement that says, no, he's Lord outside of the church too. Where people begin to squirm is when you take Jesus's Lordship outside of hearts and churches and it goes into the public square. That's where people don't know what to do. And I would love to say this is mainly unbelievers who struggle with this, but most Christians struggle with, in disclaimer, the statement, Christ is King, Jesus is Lord. What do we think we mean when we say that? What do we think we're saying when we're singing songs like, our Jesus is the King? Or when the Hebrew writer is making statements here about all things being in subjection to him. 
You see, I think for many Christians, what we've done is we've detached the Bible's teaching that the Messiah would be given the nations and that he would rule over all things. When Jesus says, all power and authority belong to me, for whatever reason, we read back into those statements, little caveats and disclaimers that reduce it down to the Lord over the little closet called my heart. And yet that's not anywhere the Bible teaches or disclaimers. When the Bible says Jesus is Lord, Christ is King, it means in totality. Now here's why most people struggle with it, including Christians. is because when we look at the world around us, we see a world that is in chaos. We see a world, if we're just being honest, that doesn't look like it's in subjection to him. We see rebels We see sickness and disease and death. We see things that we think in our minds, if Christ is Lord and King and ruling, then therefore these things shouldn't be happening. And yet the Bible says that these things absolutely are happening while he reigns, but they're only gonna happen for a period of time until he comes again. And then his reign will forever eradicate those things. That's the teaching of the Bible. In fact, that is what the Hebrew passage this morning presses us into. The idea that Jesus, unlike the angels, is superior to everything and has the world in subjection to him. If you've not been with us in Hebrews so far, let me summarize where where we've been. Hebrews 1 begins with the author saying, God has spoken at many times and in many ways all throughout creation. But in these last days, in this last period of history, he has spoken to us by his son, definitively and ultimately. This son, by the way, Jesus, is the heir of all things. He's the creator of the universe. He sustains the world by his power, by his word. He made purification for sins. He died in the place of sinners. And he was raised and ascended and is enthroned He says, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's seated at the right hand of the Father where he is in control, where he rules and reigns. And then the writer goes on to say, the Hebrew writer says, he's not like the angels. The angels never had this said about them. And then he quotes an Old Testament passage showing the glory of the Messiah. The angels never had this said about them and another passage where the Messiah is elevated. And then last week we looked at chapter two, he, he detours for just a second. He goes from, hey, the angels didn't have this said about them to, so therefore, pay attention to what you've heard. Don't, don't stray, don't drift away because how will you escape the judgment of God if you neglect this great salvation? How will you escape if you drift away, if you, if you drift off from this message and this truth? Now watch, he finishes saying that and he comes back to where he left off with the angels. So verse five, for it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come, is coming back to his argument at the end of one. Jesus is the best, nobody's like him, the angels don't compare. To which of the angels did God ever say this, or this, or this? So don't drift away, and then he comes back. To which of the angels did God ever say, the world is subjected to you? Okay, so that's where we're going today. Now let me just, hit a timeout button. If, if you've never studied Hebrews, if this is your first time in Hebrews, this is not the easiest book in the world to interpret, okay? Like if you feel like a dodo bird sometimes when you read it, um, cool, We're, you're in good company, okay? Because here's what the Hebrew writer assumes that I would just be honest, most of us don't have. He assumes a very clear first century Jewish understanding of the Old Testament and all the symbols and all the signs. And just be honest, we as Christians don't often have ourselves immersed in that understanding. But he's appealing to it over and over and over again. And one of the reasons why he appeals to Jesus is better than angels, we don't even, we don't even question that. But first century Jews did. First century Jews elevated angels so high that the question was like, well, could this could this Jesus guy be better than the angels? And the answer is yes, because which of the angels ever had this said about them? That's his argument, okay? So, so here's what we're gonna look at this morning. He's gonna continue to make that argument, but he's gonna make some big claims about Jesus, namely that everything in the world is subjected to him. Let's look at it together, beginning in verse five. For it was not to the angels that God subjected 
the world to come, of which we are speaking. So the world to come, that phrase uh, is not only going to drive the text today, but it's going to be a phrase that drives the whole letter. The idea of there is still a world to come. We're living in the world as it is, but this is not the world as it will be ultimately. Now, when he says world to come, then what is he referring to? He's referring to the end of all things. He's referring to the day where Christ returns and makes all things new. One of the big hopes of the Christian life is is not that um, we're gonna escape the world, right? It's not that we're gonna escape the world forever and you know, the world can just kind of you know, go off into destruction. The hope of the Christian is that one day Christ will return and restore the world. There is a world to come. Let me read it for you. Revelation 21 gives us a picture of this world. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Pause there. This is a picture of the end of of the age. And I want you to notice this. The imagery that we're being given here is that a new heaven and a new earth are coming down from heaven. Earth is being invaded by heaven. And heaven is coming down like a bride adorned in beauty, walking down the aisle, coming down to earth, adorned to her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And what's the evidences that this is the world to come that will be eternity, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, meaning grieving, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. The world to come has come in this reality. And he who was seated on the throne said, that's Christ, behold, I am making all things new. And he also said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So watch, the Christian life is lived with an eye on that day. The day when Jesus, who came into the world, who lived, who died, who rose again, who ascended to heaven, and we're gonna see this in a moment, is seated in power and in glory, but we're awaiting not the day where we go to him. What we're ultimately awaiting is the day he will return to us. The heavens come to the earth and all things are made new. Okay, you with me? Hang that thought there. Go to verse six. It has been testified somewhere. By the way, this is Hebrews all day long. It's been testified somewhere and then quotes the Old Testament, okay? So we're gonna do some Old Testament quoting this morning. Psalm eight is what he's about to quote. If you wanna go to Psalm eight, put your finger there. We're gonna flip over there and look at it in just a second. But he's gonna quote it. Let's watch what he says. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now this feels like a weird quote in the middle of this argument. Jesus is better than the angels. And what angels ever had the world to come subjected to them? And then he goes, you know, it was said somewhere. And then he quotes this, what is man that you're mindful of him? So that is Psalm 8. David, the psalmist, is writing. And there's two things going on here. David doesn't even know he's doing them. There's two things going on. David is speaking about mankind in general, all of us in general, but he's also speaking about the son of man, the Messiah in particular. Watch what he says. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You have made him, him is operating in two ways, mankind and the son of man. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, that's angels. 
and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and beasts of the field and birds of the heaven and fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Okay, watch this. David is writing about mankind's special role in creation. In Psalm 8, he, he starts by going, what is man? He's so insignificant. He's so small. Look at, look at the galaxies, the universe. Look at all of creation and, and think about how tiny we are. And yet, despite how small we are, God's mindful of us. God's given us a role where we have been, watch what he says, given a crown of glory and honor. Yes, we were. What David is thinking about in Psalm 8, he's thinking about Genesis 1 where you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, sheep and oxen. David's thinking about Genesis 1, which says this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, watch this, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So David, writing about man's insignificance, and yet man's great significance in the role that God has given him, says we've been made a little lower than the angels, yet we have dominion and rule over everything. We've been given rule and dominion over everything. We're told to subdue it. We're the image bearers. We are the reflectors of God to the creation with a special role of ruling it. The cultural mandate is that we subdue it. We build culture. We have families, right? This is what we're told to do. But watch, but David also mentions the son of man in that passage. And everything that he's saying about man in general, he's also saying about the son of man which has a whole different significance. He says, the son of man, which by the way, is a, a, a title that can mean mankind or talking about the Messiah. The son of man in Daniel is referring to the Messiah. Jesus refers to himself as, in the gospels, the son of man. So watch this. David, probably really unknowingly, talks about the son of man having the crown of glory and honor all things in submission to him? Made for a little while, a little lower than the angels? Isn't that what we have just been told about Jesus in the Hebrew text? And yet, this was only for a little while. He condescended, Philippians 2 says. He who knew equality with God did not count equality with God as something to be held on to. He lowered himself. He made himself a servant by, by becoming flesh. And then he died and he rose again and now he's the name above every name. Now, now watch. David, I'm sorry, the Hebrew writer quotes David and he says this at the end. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. Now the Hebrew writer obviously is not talking about you and me. He's talking about the son of man. He's talking about the one who rules the world to come, not the angels, but Christ, the Messiah. In putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. By the way, when it says nothing outside of his control, what do you think that includes? Great job, everything. In your Bible, there's probably not a little asterisk. There's no, there's no parentheses that says, you know, hearts that love him. It's everything. Everything is under his control. There's nothing outside of his control. He has dominion over everything. He's king over everything. But watch what he then says. But at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That's the struggle. So watch, there's, there's something happening. Jesus rules over everything. He's king over everything. He has nothing in the world that's outside of his control. And yet the reason that we struggle to believe that is because of what the Hebrew writer says. Because at present, we don't see everything in subjection to him. We still see chaos. We still see rebellion. We still see sinners shaking their fist at God. But here's the reality. The Bible never tells us that the sign of his reign will be there will be no rebellion. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. 
Psalm 110, I'm gonna read two passages to you. The Hebrew writer is emphasizing the lordship of the Messiah over everything. And I want you to watch this. Psalm 110 and then, Psalm, and then 1 Corinthians 15. I want you to see both. Psalm 110, listen to these words. The Lord, all caps, Yahweh, says to my Lord. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Where have we heard that at? First, first Hebrews 1, verse 3, and, right? He's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Until what? Until I make your enemies your footstool. In other words, you are already at the right hand in power, in glory, all things subjected to you, yet, yet your enemies are still out there. In fact, he goes on, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Do you see that? The Messiah is ruling in the midst of his enemies. His reign isn't being thwarted. His reign is happening in the midst of people who are still rebelling. But watch what it says. Your people will offer themselves freely. That's us. On the day of your power, in holy garments, right? Clothed in righteousness. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Watch this. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We've, we've talked about Melchizedek before in, in Genesis. We're gonna talk about Melchizedek in Hebrews as well because Melchizedek is the one without descendants, without mother or father, the one who is eternal and he's a type of Christ. Psalm 110 is about this Melchizedek, this Lord who sits at the right hand of the Lord, this one who rules while his enemies are being made a footstool. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. That's all of Psalm 110. It's a, it's a, it's a psalm about the Messiah's rule in the midst of his enemies. Go back to Hebrews. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. But at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Why? They're still enemies. Which is why the first Corinthians uh, letter Paul said this, for he, Christ, must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. Which, by the way, the last enemy to be destroyed will be what? Death. He is reigning and his enemies are being put under his feet. And the last one to be destroyed will be death. Verse 27, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Friends, the Bible makes it very clear Jesus is Lord over everything, everywhere, at all times. This morning, he is on the throne in power and he's, his enemies are being made a footstool under him. His enemies are given a measure of ability to continue to operate, but even then, it's all under his plan and moving towards the day of his return. This is why it's fascinating to me. It's easier for many Christians to acknowledge that the God of this world, Satan, is active, but we don't acknowledge Jesus as king. It's easier for us to say the God of this world is Satan, and it's hard for us to say Jesus is king without disclaimer. Satan's on a leash. Satan can only do what is permitted to him. He's not operating outside of the control of the king. The book of Job tells you that. The king rules and he reigns and the picture is that he is currently over his enemies and the last enemy that will be defeated will be death, which is when he returns in Revelation 21 that I read unfolds. Then verse nine, we see this. Verse nine, but we see him, Christ, who for a little while was made lower than the angels. There's that lower than the angels part, right? For a little while, he was made lower than the angels. Crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Let me summarize what's just been said so you can follow. Christ is superior to the angels. None of them have been given the world to come to rule over. He, he has 
But not only has he been given the world to come, he rules currently. All things are in subjection to him, nothing outside his control. And then he quotes the psalmist who says, you remember the first Adam who had all things under him, who was supposed to take rule and dominion and subdue, but he failed. The second Adam has come. And where the first Adam failed, he succeeded. He obeyed the law of God. He, he was righteous in all of his ways. And he knew no sin. But the one who came as the second Adam died in the place of fallen humanity so that those who put their faith in the second Adam, watch this, are restored and now are able, and I'm gonna get into this in just a moment, we are now able to live out the mandate that we were originally given to begin with. You realize that heaven is a picture and and it's a reconstitution of the garden. What we lost in the garden because of sin by the failure of our first Adam is gonna be made new by by the victory of the second Adam and the return of Christ and the return of heaven to earth is life in the garden again. That's where we're heading, that's where we're going. He rules over it all. And even though there are still enemies and rebels, it doesn't mean that he's not ruling. They're they're allowed to rebel for a period until he returns. Now, here's what I wanna do. I wanna wanna take some some takeaways for this. I I wanna extract some points for us to begin to think about, okay? The first one is this, and I can't stress this enough. All things are in subjection to Jesus. The number of Christians who don't understand that is staggering. Who think that basically Christ is Lord over the ghetto, the Christian ghetto, and everywhere else runs amok. The Bible says that Jesus is over everything, over every single thing. All things are in subjection to him. And just because you can't see All things in subjection doesn't mean it isn't. For example, when the Lord tells Abram, I'm gonna give you descendants as numerous as those stars, he's got zero descendants. You know what's more true in that moment? What God has said, not what Abraham sees. Do you know when we invaded Normandy in World War II? When we invaded Normandy, that was it. The war was essentially over. When we successfully landed on the beaches, it was only a matter of time before the ultimate defeat of Germany. But guess what? They still had a lot of war to fight, even though the war was won at that point. That's the kind of world we're living in right now. The war is won. Christ is Lord. He's supreme over everything. But there is still a time where bullets are flying until the end of the age that Christ himself is directing to its appointed end. The Bible, theologians call this the already and not yet. The already and not yet. Christ is already reigning fully, but there is not yet the world to come that, that will be ultimately. We're waiting for the world to come. It's still in front of us. So we live in this tension of already Christ reigns, he rules, all things are in subjection, and not yet have we seen the fullness of everyone subjected under him. Here's the second thing I want us to see. The first Adam failed to exercise righteous dominion, but Christ, the second Adam, succeeds. Adam was given the cultural mandate to fill the earth, to subdue it, to take dominion. And this is still the call, guys. This is still what we exist to do. But only as we come under the headship of the second Adam can we fulfill it. You see, Adam failed, our fathers failed. And here's what the Bible's teaching is. You're born into Adam, every one of us. We're children of Adam. But we must be born again into Christ, the second Adam. And those who are in Christ, the second Adam, who fulfilled everything that the first Adam failed at, the one who rules and exercises dominion in righteousness, that second Adam, we are called to be found in him and watch. And if we are in Christ, we are then called to do what? Fulfill the cultural mandate to reign and rule with dominion, to be fruitful and multiply. The mandate given to Adam still applies to us. Though we've sinned, redemption in Christ makes it possible for us to fulfill our calling. So for example, this is why we should do things like build families, 
and plant gardens and raise cattle and create products and build businesses and write stories and make music and cook good meals and drink good wine and design beautiful buildings and run for political office and invent new technologies because we are called to subdue the earth to the glory of God. These earthy things, I'm going to get into this, for many Christians, sounds unspiritual, and it shows you how far off we are to what we were made to do. We hear the Deuteronomic blessings in Deuteronomy given to the children of Israel, that Canaan will be theirs, a land flowing with milk and honey, and what we do is we transfer the promises of the New Testament to being purely spiritual. No, friends, we are called under the reign of Christ to bring about a world that's coming. To bring about a world that's coming, to build, to glorify God in the establishment of these things. The reason we struggle so much with this is because we've detached the continuity between earth and heaven that's to come. We've detached the continuity the Bible makes very clear. The reason that we don't have any concept for why we should invest in building things here is because we've developed in the 20th and 21st century in our American churches an escapist mentality. We wanna escape the world and, and, and the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. That's Gnosticism. We are called to usher forth a kingdom that's come. That's why Jesus says when you pray, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want it to come to earth. We're not trying to escape. It's not the big bad earth and we need to go off to where it's spiritual. There's a continuity between what we do here and the world to come, which leads me to the third point. The world to come will be earthy and glorious. It will be earthy and glorious. I don't know if earthy is a word, but I'm rolling with it. One of the reasons that we don't take the mandate serious is we have an insufficient view of heaven. We have an unbiblical view of heaven. Many think of heaven in terms of disembodied experience. Now make no mistake, when we die, we will be absent from the body for a period of time. The the Bible says we will be present with the Lord, but we will be absent from this body. But did you know the majority of the Bible's teaching on heaven has nothing to do with that period of when your soul goes to heaven with Christ? You know what the majority of the teaching of the Bible is about, about heaven? It's when Christ comes back to earth and establishes the new heavens and the new earth. Do you know that the hope of the Christian isn't to be like a little spiritual glowy orby thing floating around on clouds one day? Did you know that our hope is earthy? That Revelation 21 when heaven comes to earth and Christ rules among us, that's what we look forward to. We look forward to smelling the fresh blooms of a flower. We look forward to hearing the singing and chirping of birds. We look forward to singing and laughing and talking. We look forward to blades of grass under our feet. There's a world to come that is like this world. It's a return to the garden. It's a return to what we were made for. And you're gonna cook meals and you're likely gonna plant trees and maybe visit nations and galaxies. You're gonna climb mountains and read books and water ski and choreograph dances and tell jokes and make plays. Like the fact that that sounds foreign to us when we think of heaven shows you how deficient our view is, how detached we've become from the Bible's view. When Christ returns, he's making all things new here. The world to come will still be a world, guys. It will still be a world. We're not trying to escape the body or the physical world. You and I were made as creatures with body and soul. You're not a soul that happens to have a bag of flesh. You're a body and a soul. And one day, that body, though buried in death, will be raised in glory to live forever. That's the hope of heaven. The resurrection of the dead into a world made new. 
That's where we're going. That's what we're doing. And that's what Christ, reigning from the right hand of the Father this morning, is calling us to bring about in the world now on earth as it is in heaven. As he rules and brings all of his enemies under his feet, we're called to labor under the cultural mandate and build our institutions and build our families and then do it to the glory of God, awaiting the day where he returns. And what will we do then? We'll continue doing that forever with the king with us. That's the teaching of the Bible. That's the hope of the Christian. And those of us who will get to experience and enjoy that is in verse nine. It's because the one who is crowned with glory and honor suffered death so that we didn't taste death. He tasted death on behalf of his people so that his people could live forever with him in the new heavens and new earth. And here's the Hebrew writer's whole point. You ready? And no angel was ever given that promise. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for this glorious vision, not of a world that will be, but of a reality that is now. You are reigning with all things in subjection to you. Nothing is outside of your control. That gives hope to us this morning. It gives hope to people who are hurting gives hope to people who are anxious, gives hope to people who are sick. All things are in subjection to you, every molecule, every raindrop, every nation. And so we put our confidence in you. And even though the world around us doesn't look like it's in full subjection, we look not to what we see, but what we know. All your enemies will be brought under your feet, including death. And we await that day where the world to come will finally usher in an eternal reign of the king with his people. Help us today to build worlds that will last forever. Help us to build and to live under the mandate as those who are in the second Adam, those who are redeemed and righteous, help us to reflect that to the world And so fulfill our calling. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until you come, give us confidence and hope in your name. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.